So I want to talk a little bit about your Berean ship. How is it? <laughs> um, I used to listen to a great teacher named Chuck Missler, who was a gentleman. And there was a civility among the gentlemen <laughs> uh, that he would always preface everything he said with Acts 1711. Um, now the Bereans were more noble-minded than those at, Thess at Thessalonica, right? In that they searched the scriptures daily to see, they received the word with all gladness, readiness of mind. But search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. They didn't just, and he would always say, that means don't listen to Chuck Missler. Don't believe it just because I say it. Look it up and do your homework. And I get that, for especially considering he dealt with a lot of arcane topics. Um, and, you know, that's a civil way of doing things. I tend to be, I've been accused of being dogmatic before. I, I tend to, once I've seen something... I just lay it out there, wrong and strong, you know. Um, but at the same time, when God shows me something that needs to be corrected, I'm, I, if I see it, I'll change my view. But I'll argue, you know, if I see something and I have reason to believe what I believe, I'll argue. Now, some people think that because I'm arguing that that means I'm mad or something like that. Um, and I can get passionate too. I'm Afrocentric in my personality where, you know, the first round of debate is kind of like, well, you set out your facts. And then the second round, once you start supporting your facts with other facts, you start to get a little emphatic. And as you get emphatic, Eurocentric people say, oh, wait a second. If you were going to get like this, I'm not going to, let's just disengage and agree to disagree. This is terrible. I didn't know you were going to get all excited and out of control. <laughs> And sometimes they think they've won the argument because they kept control of their emotions and you got all emphatic. Uh, it just shuts down. Um, but that's who I am, you know. I tend to be emphatic and some people think that if they question me and I come back with some facts and say, no, it's this and this is why I believe that, somehow it sounds like the, the passion that's fueling it sounds like, uh-oh, he's angry at me. Well, that's not the case. If, especially if we're not disagreeing about something essential, you know. But I say things strongly, and you do need to be convinced in your own mind. Paul said, let everybody could be fully convinced in their own mind. Um, now, the Nicolaitans, God hates the Nicolaitans because they subdue the lady, they conquer the lady, and impose a dogmatic point of view that everybody's required to obey in order to be in fellowship with them. God doesn't like that. But then he also doesn't like the Laodiceans. The Laodicean is the opinion or the rule of the laity. And in Laodicea there were two uh, it was known for having two fountains. One really cold and one hot. And then they came together and produced a lukewarm mixture. They never could get it right. and tasted terrible apparently. I read that somewhere. Look it up. Um, lukewarm comes from the combining or the synthesis of everybody's idea. Everybody's got a point of view, brother. You can't just be dogmatic about your own. So everybody, the strong points of view get kind of lost in favor of a group think that's genteel and nice but has no bite to it. And Paul said there must be heresies among you that those who are approved may be manifested. And I've always been in favor of people coming out and really stating what they believe without apology and then being willing to be corrected if the word sheds other light. You know, that's intellectually honest. I find the idea that you should say, well, various people disagree on this matter, but here's how I feel it is. Well, the problem with that is that you'll never state anything strongly enough that it becomes an issue for people to be concerned about. And, you know, I, I just got a text from a f friend of mine. I had a birthday yesterday. Happy birthday to me. He said, happy birthday. We should get together for lunch. Now, I know he doesn't want to get together for lunch. So I said, oh, okay, I'm a free any day next week. Well, he didn't respond. He was just being nice. He didn't expect me to take him up on it. Now, this guy goes to a church where he's one of the few actual believers. And it's an emergent church. And the 
pastor preaches apostasy and Christian atheism from the pulpit, and most of the people there don't believe that the Word of God should be taken literally. And I've always just been bewildered at how he can survive that environment, but everybody there is so nice, and he gets along with them fabulously. Well, it's because the only way you can, if you're a believer, the only way you can survive in an environment like that is to be political and be amicable and keep your opinion to yourself and say, well, good people have, you know, disagreed on this matter and that matter. Why do you have to be so divisive and insisting? And that's one of the reasons he doesn't want to have lunch with me because I tend to come out and say what I feel. I've always been in trouble about that and I've always been accused of divisiveness because of it. But if I was political, then I would never be able to teach the way I would teach. I teach strongly what I believe, you know? And um, so anyway, why do I say all this? You know, he that environment has made him be able to say something like, oh, we should go out to have lunch sometime, but when I call him on it, he really doesn't mean it. And that's kind of what you do in those environments. You end up just... Everything is just, you think you're keeping the fellowship because no one's fighting, but actually no one's saying anything either. It's just pleasantries and nice talk. And nobody's growing because there's no friction. There's no tension. There must be heresies among you that those who are approved may be manifested. We need people to come out. You know, we don't like right now that the wolves are coming out and showing their fangs and showing what they are. But you know what? It's a lot better than them being Mr. Nice Guy Ned Flanders and you have to sit with them at church and you can't figure out what's wrong, why you don't have any fellowship with these really nice people. It's better that they come out for what they really believe and everything's clear because you know what? Then the gospel gets contended for and you fight for it and things become important and you're no longer lukewarm mixing cold and hot but you're either cold or hot. Better to be cold or hot. That's what Jesus wishes. So let's be hot or cold. But, yeah, search the scriptures. There are, for example, the thing I talked about with the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven. There are learned Bible scholars that would fully disagree with what I said. How it, and and would, would say, well, it's not a matter of salvation, so you shouldn't be so strong about it. Well, that's because you haven't been brought into bondage of a teaching that mixes the two. Once you've been brought into bondage to something, you see things about a truth that other people have said, oh, we can just disagree, agree to disagree about that. And um, you can't once you see it is a salvation issue. If you say that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the same thing, you may not realize what you're doing, but you're opening the door for things that apply to the kingdom of heaven to apply to the church, and that brings in confusion. Amillennialism, dominionism, possible loss of salvation, all kinds of stuff comes in through that door of mixing the kingdom teachings that, that are revealed in the synoptics and the kingdom of God, which is refer mentioned in the gospels and also in the church age and has to do with the life of God. So are there people that would disagree with me that have written more bo have written books and ha are famous teachers and are godly men who know the spirit and know Christ? Yeah. But I've always said that there's a difference between the way you look at truth when someone's standing on your chest and you're lying on the ground beaten and bleeding. And when you're standing upright and everything's just fine. I happen to have triggered all the traps and I've been laying on my on the ground looking up at truth, bleeding for years with authoritarian people pressing on my chest, demanding this and that. And so I have a perspective of a lot of truths that I think a lot of people don't have because I've seen a, the dark side of a lot of it. And, uh, you know... The church is, for the longest time, you couldn't talk about, you can't talk about the end time stuff in the institutional churches. They say it's, it, why? Because people debate and have various different views and we don't like to get dogmatic and we don't want people to disagree and get in division. Well, the problem with that is that while you guys refuse to talk about it, an erroneous, highly systematized, false theology was developed by wolves so that next time the subject came up, 
the landscape is completely different. There's this whole orchestrated system of theology that's been built and engineered by the devil to trap people. And they're not grounded in the truth at all because it's something they were never allowed to talk about. And they were told, oh, this isn't a matter of salvation. This is just side issues. You shouldn't get involved in all that. You shouldn't chase that down. So they're wide open to, oh, let's talk about prophecy. And then they get some NAR thing where it's, well, we're going to go through the tribulation. We're going to be calling down judgments and we're going to be the manifested sons of God. And, and it's combined with a works theology and it's full of fear and it's completely a re recasting of the role of the church and it's antichrist because it replaces Christ with the church doing the things that only Christ should do. Um, so yeah, I think instead of saying, let's all just agree to disagree and be silent on matters that are not critical. I think we should all just be as loud as possible about what we believe and be willing to argue it out. You know, if it's important, it's worth debating. If it's not, the debate will fizzle out. And not be afraid of being in division or hurting someone's feeling or making someone mad because you disagree with them on a point or a word. Let's see what the facts say, not what our feelings say. If your facts from the word disprove me, then so be it. You know, I need to back down. And I might get a little heated, but that doesn't mean I'm in division or a heretic. So, um, all this stuff I say to be a Berean, but let's not be political. Let's be loud, loud. Let's, let's not just, if we're convinced of something, let's say it. Even if, if it proves we're wrong, then we'll take the correction. But we've got to be able to step out in faith and say what we believe so that these matters can come to light and not be hidden all the time. Lying under the surface is unresolved issues and elephants in the room. All right, take care.